a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, Preface and the Stranger's History, Part 2. The Stranger's History. I am an American. I was born and reared in Hartford, in the state of Connecticut, anyway, just over the river, in the country. So I am a Yankee of the Yankees, and practical, yes, and nearly barren of sentiment. I suppose, or poetry, in other words. My father was a blacksmith, my uncle was an orth doctor, and I was both, along at first. Then I went over to the great arms factory and ruined my real trade, learned all there was to it, learned to make everything, guns, revolvers, cannon, boilers, engines, all sorts of labor-saving machinery. Why, I could make anything a body wanted, anything in the world, it didn't make any difference what. And if there wasn't any quick, newfangled way to make a thing, I could invent one, or do it as easy as rolling off a log. I became head and superintendent, had a couple of thousand men under me. Well, a man like that is a man that is full of fight, that goes without saying. With a couple of thousand rough men under one, one is money to have that sort of amusement. I had, anyway. At last I met my match, and I got my dose. It was during a misunderstanding conducted with crowbars with a fellow we used to call Hercules. He laid me out with a crusher alongside the head that made everything crack, and seemed to spring every joint in my skull and make it overlap its neighbor. And the world went out in darkness, and I didn't feel anything more, and I didn't know anything at all, at least for a while. When I came to again, I was sitting under an oak tree on the grass, with a full, beautiful, and broad country landscape all to myself. Nearly. Not entirely, for there was a fellow on a horse looking down at me, and a fellow fresh out of a picture book. He was an old-time iron armor from head to heel, with a helmet on his head the shape of a nail keg with slits in it. And he had a shield and a sword and a prodigious spear, and his horse had armor on it on too, and a steel horn projecting from his forehead, and gorgeous red and green silk trappings that hung down all around him like a bedquilt, nearly to the ground. Fair sir, will you eat just? said this fellow. Will I which? Will you try ye a passage of arms for land or lady or what are you giving me? I said. Get along back to your circus or I'll report you. Now what does this man do but pull back a couple of hundred yards and then come rushing at me as hard as he could tear with his nail keg bent down nearly to his horse's neck and his long spear pointed straight ahead. I saw he meant business, so I was up the tree when he arrived. He allowed that I was his property, the captive of his spear. There was argument on his side, and the bulk of the advantage, so I judged it best to humor him. We fixed up an agreement whereby I was to go with him, and he was not to hurt me. I came down, and we started away, I walked by the side of his horse. We marched comfortably along, through glades and over brooks which I could not remember to have seen before, which puzzled me and made me wonder. Yet we did not come to any circus or a sign of a circus, so we gave up the idea of a circus and concluded he was in the, from an asylum. But we never came to the asylum, so I was up a stump, as you may say. I asked how, how, how far we were from Hartford. He said he never heard of the place, which I took to be a lie, but allowed it to go at that. At the end of an hour, we saw a faraway town sleeping in a valley by a winding river. Beyond it on a hill, a vast gray fortress with towers and turrets, the first I had ever seen out of the picture. Bridgeport, said I, pointing. Camelot, said he. My stranger had been showing signs of sleepiness. He caught himself nodding now, and he smiled up one of those pathetic, obsolete smiles of his, and said, I find I can't go on, but come with me. I've got it all written out, and you can read it if you like. In his chamber, he said, First I kept a journal, then by and by, after years, I took the journal and turned it into a book. How long ago that was. He handed me his manuscript and pointed out the place where I should begin. Begin here, I've already told you what goes before. He was steeped in drowsiness by this time. As I went out the, the, the door, I heard him murmur sleepily. Give you good den, fair sir. I sat down by my fire and examined my treasure. The first part of it, the great bulk of it, was parchment, and yellow with age. I scanned a leaf partially and saw that it was a palpacet. Under the old, dim writing of the Yankee historian appeared traces of a penmanship which was older and dimmer still, Latin words and sentences, fragments from old monkish legends, obviously. 
I turned to the place indicated by my stranger and began to read as follows. The end of part two of Preface and Stranger's History.